Hey guys, welcome back to Checkerboard Chat, the official sports podcast of the Daily Beacon. I'm Blake Von Hagen, he's Will Backus. We're here to recap Tennessee's upset win over number 21 Auburn and look ahead to Tennessee's matchup with number one Alabama. Well, Tennessee had a lot of firsts yesterday. Uh, it was the first SEC win in a long time, the first win over an SEC West opponent in a long time, uh, the first SEC win for head coach Jeremy Pruitt. Um, first win against Auburn since 1999. There were a lot of firsts for Tennessee in their 30-24 to 24 win yesterday. Right, yeah, it's the first time they beat an SEC West opponent since 2010 when they beat Ole Miss. Um, first SEC win in 11 games, which is huge. It was their first win over a ranked opponent uh, since 2016 and their first on the road since I'm not sure it's been a while but it was definitely a huge win it's kind of one of those wins that people talk about as a, a defining win for a new head coach especially one that's coming into a program like Tennessee that's had a decade of just kind of being down in the dumps so it's a big win for Pruitt it's a big statement win for Pruitt it shows people that he's, he's on the right track with what he's wanting to do at Tennessee yeah, and we didn't have a checkerboard chat last week because of fall break, but if we had had a checkerboard chat, then we both would have been wrong because we both would have predicted Auburn to win the game. Uh, we would have talked about the locker room struggles that were happening at Auburn. There were a lot of reports about uh, players not getting along, not trusting their head coach, and uh, you know they had lost a few games coming into the Tennessee game, and it kind of... You could, you could tell that that spilled over. It reminded us a lot of last season as things started to unravel for Tennessee, um, where things just continued to go downhill for Auburn in that game, and Tennessee took full advantage of that. Right. You mentioned the turmoil, and it seemed kind of like a letdown game for Auburn because they had just come off a loss to Mississippi State. They were in the top 10 until they lost to Mississippi State, and they dropped all the way to number 21, and they came into this game against Tennessee. They've got... A tough game. They've got. Uh, they were looking forward to a trip to Ole Miss, which Ole Miss is always a pretty tough team to play, especially at home. So it felt like a letdown game, but I still thought that Auburn was going to get it done because it was at home and Tennessee. So we thought wasn't that great of a team, and it, it kind of seemed like a, a rebuilding season anyway for Tennessee. So I thought Auburn would get the win, but it turned out not at all. Yeah, and I don't even know if it was so much of looking ahead, but they might have just been down in the dumps like you said like they were they're a team that was wanting to contend for a national championship going into the season and then all of a sudden they're about to drop out of the top 25 and they lose this game they're definitely now out of the top 25 but it was just one of those games where things kind of snowball for them throughout the season and that continued and Tennessee took advantage of that and uh, you know Auburn it didn't look like it was going to go that way at the beginning of the game Auburn gashes Tennessee's defense for a 7-0 lead first drive and Auburn comes into the game 12th out of 14 teams in the SEC in rushing uh, offense they run the ball almost every play that first drive right down the third Tennessee's defense and take that 7-0 lead and then Tennessee uh, responds kick a field goal Auburn responds with another field goal halftime at 17 to 13 and then coming out into the second half Tennessee Garantano with the pass to Juwan Jennings for a touchdown and then that crazy play where Auburn fumbles it, Tennessee picks it up, scores a touchdown on just a wacky play, and that's where Tennessee really made their mark in the game. You asked Pruitt after the game, you know, was there, there were a lot of momentum swings in this game. Was there one that stood out? And he mentioned that play. That was the first thing he mentioned was that touchdown play that puts it a double-digit uh, deficit for Auburn. And then Tennessee was able to hang on. Auburn scores a late touchdown, but Tennessee hangs on to win. Right. That was a, that was a, a wacky play, that fumble. It looked like... Auburn recovered it, but then it somehow ends up in Alante Taylor's hands and Tennessee was scoring, and you couldn't even really see what happened on the review. It was just kind of a weird play, but that was really what set the tone for Tennessee. That was, I think, the moment where the team might have realized, hey, we can actually do this. There was still a lot of time left on the clock when they scored that touchdown, and they were up, I believe, 27 at that point, 27-17, and there was still a whole lot of time left. I think there was still... A, probably over halfway to go in the fourth quarter. So Auburn yeah. could have taken the ball and driven, but Tennessee's defense, they had a pretty good game as a whole. They stepped up, especially at the end there, until they let that last Auburn touchdown happen, which may not have even been a touchdown. But it, they, their defense played very well the whole game. The pass rush was on point. They got to stit him a lot. Uh, I don't believe they sacked him maybe a couple times, but they forced him to make a couple very – questionable throws that ended up being interceptions for Tennessee. 
one of which I believe they scored a touchdown off of, and the other one, their drive kind of faltered. But they, they did a great job of getting to Stidham and taking advantage of an offensive line that allowed two and a half sacks a game. Um, so even with the, their kind of backs against the wall, not, not against the wall, but with Auburn having a chance to make it more interesting, Tennessee's defense stepped up in the end and you know, I think was what sold it for Tennessee. Yeah, and I'm sure for Jeremy Pruitt, when he brings pressure on Stidham early in the game, he sees Stidham just, I mean, he looks so uncomfortable in the pocket when he's getting pressured. I'm sure that for Pruitt, that's like a shark smelling blood in the water. I mean, he, he knew that he just needed to continue to pressure Stidham and he continued to make mistakes throughout the game. Auburn cannot adjust to that pressure. And in the end, Tennessee's defense hangs on. But I think almost more importantly is Tennessee's offense, their ability to put points on the board, which they haven't shown the ability to do that all season. Uh, or for the entire season, they have it at, in spurts. But that game yesterday, um, you know, Tennessee's offense is able to, to get it done. And I think Garantano looked really sharp in that game. He, they, they tested Auburn's secondary, which is something they haven't been doing a lot all season. And they, used, they utilized their playmaker, playmakers in Juwan Jennings and Marquez Callaway, throwing them some deep balls. And those guys were able to go up and make plays. And that's really what put Tennessee ahead. Right. I think that was the best game Tennessee's passing game had. They hadn't scored 14, more than 14 points uh, against an SEC opponent to that point. They scored, or sorry, they scored 27 I think against Florida, um, or 21 against Florida, and then, but they hadn't scored really that much at all. They scored 14 against West Virginia and 12 against Georgia. So they'd really struggled to put points on the board against Power Five teams. And Garantano hadn't gotten past 200 passing yards for the season, even against opponents like ETSU and UTEP but then he comes out yesterday and he throws for 328 yards and two touchdowns and a lot of that was the wide receivers they went up there and they made some really tough plays they brought down some 50-50 balls especially Marquez Callaway he had a couple of highlight catches on third down right too. and then Jennings with that catch in the end zone he wrestled it away from the defender so they and Garantano was 11 for 14 on third downs and he was eight for eight on third downs of eight yards or longer which is huge for Tennessee because they had a lot they had their backs against the wall in a lot of those situations because of the run game the run game was very ineffective for most of the day the Tennessee's running backs got just 76 total yards on the ground and they averaged three guys got carries and they averaged I think 1.7 yards a carry so when your ground game isn't performing like that but you still put 30 points up on the board and beat a ranked SEC West team on the road. That's pretty big for Tennessee's offense. Yeah, and third downs kind of looked like they're going to be the, the story of the day. After that first drive, Auburn converts three out of three on third downs, and Tennessee's defense wasn't able to get off the field. It looked like that might be the story, but then Tennessee's offense flips a script on that, and they're the ones that are converting third downs throughout the game. Tennessee's defense makes some plays on third downs, so that's kind of how that flipped. But, yeah, going back to the rushing attack, it looked like um, it was. There's a funny tweet that you know is setting up a play action on first down the entire game, and then Tennessee does finally go deep at the end of the game and convert on a really big play, and uh, that was one of the things that, that was notable. A difference from this year going back to last season is that taking shots mentality late in the game. When when you're up, you have a lead, but it's not you know you don't have a big lead, you know, you need to continue to put points on the board and prove it. You know, he emphasized continuing to play, continuing to take shots down the field, which had been effective all game, and that's what helped Tennessee, you know, get out to that lead. Right. Speaking of taking shots, I think Garantano, or the passing game had, I, by my count, eight plays that went for 20 yards or more. And that's pretty big for an offense that's struggling to get it done on the ground. Garantano had a 42 yard passing touchdown to Ty Chandler, he had a 30 yard pass to that, that's the Josh Palmer one where you're talking about on play action. That, yep. was, a, that was a big call late. In the fourth quarter when they could have just sat there and bled the clock and tried to get some time running down they decided to take a shot and set them up in field goal range and really kind of puts it out of play for Auburn because it made it I believe a three possession game so it or it was a two possession game but it was a hard get it was a hard lead to come back from so taking shots like that I think is really what Tennessee needed to do to win and that made that probably wasn't something they would have done last year they would have tried to run it out and who knows what would have happened yeah it seemed like the tide kind of turned for good on that on that deep ball to Palmer you saw Auburn fans starting to leave the state and you, you heard Tennessee fans even from the press box you heard them starting to make noise in the corner that's something that the players and Pruitt addressed after the game was the Tennessee fan support uh, over 5,000 Tennessee fans were there and they were certainly making noise 
Auburn, it's a noon kickoff, so Auburn's fans not going to have the normal energy, especially with what they had gone through the past few games. And Tennessee's fans took advantage of that, and it almost kind of neutralized the, the home field aspect. Right. We were down on the field for the last five minutes of the game, and Tennessee's fans were loud, and the band was playing, and they were singing Rocky Top. And it was, it was definitely it was, it was a big confidence booster, I would assume, for Tennessee, especially seeing a team that's you know, had their worst season last year, and then this season was looking like it, was, it, made, it may have been worse. So it was probably big for Tennessee to have that kind of fan support travel to Auburn and watch Tennessee pick up arguably one of their biggest wins in quite a few years. So the the coaches and the players, like you said, both spoke that that was a huge thing for them. And, you know, we'll see how, if that support continues moving forward. Yeah, Garantano got emotional after the game. That was his first time speaking with the media this season. He got emotional talking about the fans that were there, his family that was there watching him. And, uh, you know, it, it was he, he felt like it was a really good win for Tennessee, which it clearly was. And now the tide is turning the other way as Tennessee faces the Crimson Tide. That's a terrible pun, but uh, the Crimson Tide coming to Knoxville next week. Uh, Tennessee will face the number one team in the country, and obviously, you know, all the accolades are there for Alabama. You don't really need to say a whole lot about them. They've got Nick Saban uh, to it, quarterback, all the, the running backs, the defense, which is not up to the normal Alabama defensive uh, standards, but... It's still an Alabama defense, and they have blown out every opponent so far this season. Right. People like to say the one thing holding Alabama back, and it's a joke because Alabama is still consistently one of the top five teams is having a good quarterback, and now they do in Dua. In the first quarter against Missouri, I think he had 200-something yards and three touchdowns, and he left that game with injury, and he didn't come back, and it's still a stat line that you see quarterbacks. He, he didn't play, I think, for a majority of the second quarter and then the whole second half, of, as far to my knowledge. And he put up a stat line that you usually see quarterbacks put up for an entire game in just a quarter and a half of play. So he's, he's kind of one of those human highlight reels. He has not thrown an interception. The Missouri game was the first time he turned over the ball and he fumbled it on a sack. So it was, he's, he's one of the most dynamic players in college football, probably the front runner for the Heisman. Uh, and he may, not, he may not even play against Tennessee. We'll see. He did injure himself against uh, Missouri, but even if Alabama has to play Jalen Hurts, it's still a quarterback that took him to back-to-back national championships. So it may not even hurt Alabama if Tua can't play. Yeah, and there's the old cliche that the ball looks different coming out of a guy's hand, and for him, I think that is definitely the case. He just he has a different spin on the ball than than a lot of quarterbacks do. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that he got hurt in that game against Missouri, so we'll see what his status is moving forward, but regardless, they're going to have Jalen Hurts, who has had plenty of success as a college quarterback, so right. the, there's a drop-off, but I think in the end, Nick Saban was having trouble deciding who was going to be the quarterback for a little while, so it's not like it's a, a guy that's a grade 100 and then you got a guy that's a grade 80. It's it's two guys that are really good quarterbacks, and so Jalen Hurts certainly has uh, the, the talent, and he has the prestige to to carry Alabama right hurts I think he's not he's definitely not as good of a passer as Tua but I think he gets Tua in athleticism they've used hurts a couple times this year on just pure run plays or they've even swapped I think against Missouri he ran a fly sweep and then caught a pass on consecutive plays so he's a very athletic quarterback that can hurt you with his feet and he can he's a decent passer too he's not a bad passer so even if he, he provides a spark for Alabama's offense. He's seen a lot of playing time this year anyway because Tua hasn't played in the fourth quarter yet. So it's because Alabama just jumps out to massive leads against every opponent they've played, and they haven't felt the need to play Tua the whole game, and they haven't had to. So he's still familiar with Alabama's offense. It's not like he's cold. So if he has to play the whole game against Tennessee, there's really not going to be a whole lot of drop-off there. Yeah, and Alabama currently first in the SEC in total yards, and a lot of times they're taking their foot off the pedal for almost the entire second half of these games, so that's really impressive that they're able to still have the most yards in the SEC. A lot of that is their defense is getting getting the ball back to them, although their defense is, I think, 25th in the nation right now. Uh, Tennessee is at 30, 31, so not a huge uh, gap there, but overall, you know, Alabama's defense it feels like it's one of those defenses that can turn it on at any time when they move down, you know, going down the stretch of the season and they got to play some of these big games like the Iron Bowl, the SEC Championship game, assuming they make it there, and then the playoff if they continue to do what they've done the past few seasons. So we'll see if their def- what their defense does against Tennessee. I would expect Tennessee to continue to take shots down the field. It's 
I, I mean, I, I would expect Peru to come out with a nothing to lose mentality. Um, obviously, the, you can lose the game, but it's Alabama. They're likely going to be a 28, 30 point uh, favorite against Tennessee. So I would think Peru is going to take some shots down the field early in the game, try to get uh, Garantano back in that rhythm like we saw against Auburn. Right, Tennessee is going to have to come out swinging. And again, you you mentioned playing with that you know nothing to lose mentality. You're playing the number one team at home, and they'll probably be four touchdown favorites against you. So it, you really want to come out swinging, and you want to try to strike early and often uh, against, against a Alabama defense who, by Alabama standards, might be seen as weak, but still 25th in the country is nothing to sneeze at, and they have not allowed a lot of points at all this year. The point margin, I don't know the actual stat, but it has to probably be one of the best in the country just because Tennessee or Alabama is just boat racing a majority of its opponents. So I think if Tennessee is to have even a chance, they're going to have to take a lot of shots and try to get Garantano into that rhythm that he, he got in against Auburn. And Tennessee's receivers are just going to have to keep making those contested catches. Yeah, that's another thing to think about is when your offense is scoring so fast, your defense is going to be on the field more just inherently based on that. So that's you know that's one thing to look at when you take take if you take that into account, then the stat maybe they're, maybe they're not the 25th best defense in the country. But as we wrap this thing up, you have a score prediction for the Tennessee Alabama game. Uh, I think Alabama wins probably uh, I'd say 45 to seven. I don't think it's going to be a very close game. I think Tennessee could put up more points than that, but I think it would come a little bit later. Yeah, I'm going to go 48 to 10. We both watch a lot of college football, and you see that these teams coming off a huge win, it's really hard to get up for the next the next game. Even though, I mean, the players in, the, in Pruitt, they were talking about getting back to work today, you know, taking a few hours to – to kind of relish in that victory and then getting back to work. But it's really hard, especially when it's the number one team in the country and you have this huge win where you haven't had an SEC win in a long time to get back up the next week and get ready to go. So, yeah, I'm going to say Alabama uh, takes it 48-10, to 10, but, you know, it could be anywhere around there. Right. Plus, uh, Tennessee is probably going to be missing a couple of its pieces on defense. Daniel Batoli got called for targeting in the last couple minutes against Auburn. So he'll miss the first at the first half against Alabama. And then Jonathan Congbo got hurt on a block against Auburn. Uh, the, the rumor is that he sprained. He, it was an MCL injury, which sometimes those are hard to come back from. Not a torn MCL, but I believe a sprained one. So he'll probably be questionable all week for Alabama, and he may not play. So those are two injuries to watch on Tennessee, or two missing pieces on Tennessee's defense that might hurt them. Yeah, so we'll see how Tennessee fills that void. Uh, we'll be back next week to recap the Alabama game and preview the South Carolina game. But for now, thanks for watching.